Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, we're very happy to welcome you all to the third annual uh, Arbor Day Conference webinar series uh, hosted by the Rice Creek Field Station um, and the Canal Forest Restoration Project. Uh, my name is Robert Salerno. I am the Canal Forest Restoration Project intern uh, for this year. Uh, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Kristen Haynes, uh, who is Assistant Director of the Field Station um, and one of the directors of the Canal Forest Restoration Project as well. Uh, we're very happy to see you here today. Um, and we are just as happy to be kicking off uh, our Arbor Day webinar series with a talk from Glenn uh, Merchisner uh, from the New York State Hemlock Initiative. Uh, now, Caroline's background is in general ecology uh, with experience, experience in forest prairie, riparian, and leucostrine and ecosystems. Um, she holds a master's degree in environmental science from the University of Miami um, and has worked at Cornell University's New York State Hemlock Initiative uh, since 2015. Uh, there, she coordinates outreach events, uh, works with partners to facilitate conservation planning, uh, and assists uh, with program management. And so before she goes ahead with her talk, uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. If you're not the person talking, uh, just please remember to mute yourself. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to put those in the chat. Oh, we'll be getting to those at the end um, during our Q&A. Uh, but if you'd like to just ask it, you know, during, uh, during that time as well, that's perfectly fine. Um, and a couple of reminders, we will be recording these talks and they will be posted on YouTube, hopefully uh, within a week. Um, and so without further ado, uh, Carolyn, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Um, thank you guys for joining us today to, to learn about hemlocks. Um, I work for the New York State Hemlock Initiative, uh, which is a great group of folks who everybody but me works very hard on developing a biological control for hemlock woolly belgian. Um, and I do the outreach. So that's, that's who I am and where I'm coming from. Let's talk a little bit about hemlock trees and why they are what we call a foundation species in New York. Hemlock trees are our most shade adapted evergreen species and they look like this. They have this rough furrowed brown bark with a slight reddish tinge in the cracks. Um, and the foliage is this lacy looking short needled feathery evergreen foliage. The branches have a sort of a gentle drooping character versus the spruces, which are usually, unless they're a weeping one, upright. Short flat needles, they're shiny. Um, they have a pretty distinctive dark green. And then in June, their new growth is this spectacular lime green that's very noticeable. The tips are rounded. They're held opposite each other on the branch and in kind of this um, compressed X pattern. And on the underside, they have these two white stripes, which is, is how you differentiate them from like, the cones are very small and very rounded. And they're this color of sort of chestnut brown when they're ripe, but when they first, before they ripen, they're um, like a light minty green. Hemlock um, has been a significant part of our forest for thousands and thousands of years. It actually went through a uh, population collapse, I think about 17,000 years ago. We're not quite sure what happened, but they, they disappeared across the landscape and were reduced into refuges and then have been climbing back since then. When European settlers arrived, they were a very common tree. Um, their wood is not as easy to work with as pine or oak, so their timber is not as high value, but they were, the bark was great for tanning leather. And so what people tended to do was cut them down and then just strip the bark off and take it away to tan leather, leaving these strip trees in the woods because the, 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 there were so many other higher quality trees around that they just couldn't be bothered. Um, I, I did a little bit of digging and around 1910, they were starting to be used more for pulp and they're actually fine for framing. 
and um, other non-finished uses. And um, nowadays they, they get used quite a bit for wood pulp and for framing, especially as people take them down due to, due to illness. Um, there's actually been some new Amish mills that have opened up in the Finger Lakes region that are focused on, on milling hemlock for barns and other applications. This is a picture from the Harvard Forest of the 1938. Um, they had a significant nor'easter that wiped out a big chunk of the Harvard Forest and one of the trees that came down was one of these big old beautiful hemlocks. So why do we call these a foundation species? Because they're clearly not one of our priority timber species. Um, they, as I said, they're, one of, they're our most shade adapted evergreen and they, they fulfill a really unique niche in our ecosystems, which are largely hardwood forests. They, in our area, they usually grow on steep slopes and in shaded areas, and they like often to be in wet areas, so you'll see them a lot in riparian zones along rivers. They provide food or habitat for about 400 species. I've actually learned last winter that uh, one of the nicknames for this tree is the ever feeding tree because they have those sort of um, loose branches as the snowpack deepens over the winter, more of the branches get caught in the snow and pulled down so that animals can continue to browse on them all winter long. Um, when you walk into a hemlock grove in the summertime, You'll feel this kind of cool cathedral-like um, atmosphere when you walk in. That's because the temperature is 10 degrees centigrade cooler than the, the air above it. And so it's a good refuge in extreme heat in the summer. In the winter, when you walk into a hemlock road, you'll feel warmer because the, that evergreen foliage blocks some of the wind. And so it, the air is more still in the hemlock groves. And so it's a, it's a refuge in the winter as well. They also provide a lot of ecosystem services. So for aquatic systems, um, because hemlocks are evergreen, they're pulling water more in the spring and the fall when we have an overabundance of water in our ecosystems. And then they're not as active in the summer when we're often in drought. And so if you look across watersheds, the ones that have a lot of hemlock tend to have more even stream flows throughout the year than the ones that are strictly hardwood. They also help keep streams cool for a couple of reasons. They provide really dense shade um, all year round. So if they're directly overhanging a, a stream, that helps keep them cool. They also hold snowpack later into the spring under that evergreen canopy. And so that provides cold water into the, the runoff later into the spring, again, helping keep those streams cool. Another name for brook trout is hemlock trout. <laughs> Hemlocks have an association with those cold water fish assemblages. So um, in the Delaware Water Gap, there was some research done that showed that the small watersheds that had hemlock in them had up to three times more brook trout than the ones that didn't. So they're important to our cold water systems for several reasons. Um, I had to change this slide recently because hemlocks until a few years ago were the third most common tree in New York, but we've lost so many of them that now they're the fourth most common tree in New York. And this shows where they are. You can see these sort of reddish brown areas. That's where there's over 60% or more of the forest is hemlock, especially up here in this sort of Lake George area, Great Sacandaga Lake area. There's a lot of hemlock, but also up in here, um, over here in Tug Hill. And then there's a lot all through this region. It looks like there's no hemlock up here in the Lake Plain, but that's not actually true. They're still there in the gorges. They just don't show up very well in these models that are developed from aerial imagery because of the steep slopes. And this is what we don't want to see in our area. This is Pisgah National Forest and um, all throughout the southeast and the mid-Atlantic you're starting to see forests that look like this. In fact, the Great Smoky Mountain National Park is working very hard to preserve just one percent of their remaining hemlock. And the reason is 
this pest, hemlock woolly adelgid, which is an invasive pest, um, to take a step back and look at what, what the problem is here. Let's look at all the places where hemlocks are native. There's a bunch of places in Asia that have hemlock. There's a bunch of, there, there are a couple of species on the West Coast. These two places both have um, hemlock woolly adelgid as part of the native ecosystem. It's just us that didn't have it until somebody brought over a tree from Japan, probably um, around the turn of the last century and introduced hemlock woolly adelgid to the East Coast. Um, judging from the genetic works that, done, that have been done, that's what southern Japan is where our HWA came from, and they're all they're all from there. So HWA arrived, was first discovered in about 1950, many years after we think it was introduced. And then as you can see, it started to spread from there. Um, you notice some of these very disjointed um, locations where it was in the 70s. This is probably from people purchasing trees from uh, nurseries in this area and transporting the HWA. And you, it, it's just continued to spread out from those original locations. And it, the green is where it hasn't been found yet. You can see it's just moving all through the, the area. And you can also see it spreads farther and faster in the south. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Here's what has happened in New York. It arrived in the city in the late 80s, mid 80s, and then started to spread north through the lower Hudson and then into the Catskills and the Finger Lakes. Um, you, so you can see some of the lighter colors here. These were actually more of that transportation through uh, ornamental trade. So, these guys started their own, their own expansions. And then um, all of the stuff up in the Lake George area has just happened in the last few years. And all of this also we'll talk about in a minute. So what is HWA? Hemlock will read. This insect, when you're out looking for it, it looks like these white woolly looking bundles that are on the twig of the hemlocks at the base of the needles. That's where they like to be. So they're pretty easy to find um, because all you have to do is grab a branch, flip it over, look to see if you've got it. Sometimes you'll see them on the top, but they seem to like to settle on the bottom probably because there's less exposure to, to the elements. If you strip away all that wool and look at them under a really high magnification, this is what they look like. Um, these little tiny pores up here, this is where they produce their wool. And this thing that looks like a child's party straw is its mouth parts. And it sticks that down into the twig of the tree and sucks out starches that the tree has produced for its own use. We don't think it's the feeding that kills the tree. We think it's that when you have that many small wounds on a twig, the tree's response of walling off those wounds to, um, to keep disease from coming in in those locations creates enough star, scar tissue that it can't get sap to the end of the twig. And then it can't make any new foliage. And so it eventually, the tree eventually starves just because it can't make any more food. In the South, trees are dying in four years to 10 years. Up here in the north where we have cold winters that set back our populations of HWA a little bit, it's more like six to 20 years. Um, this winter was a good one for us and a bad one for HWA because we had, if you remember, a couple of really, really cold nights, a whole string of them right in a row, which was great because it, um, particularly in the higher elevation locations, killed way over 90% of our HWA. Probably not going to remove any HWA populations, but it does just give our trees a chance to breathe and recover a little bit before the populations build up again. This is this 
bug has a complicated life cycle. Um, luckily for us, a bunch of it doesn't even happen on the East Coast of the United States um, because we don't have the right secondary host for this species. So we just have two generations. We have an overwintering generation, this guy, and then we have a very short spring generation. So the overwintering generation, um, the eggs are being laid right now for that generation. And then this generation, they will grow through the spring um, and then lay the eggs for this overwintering generation in the late spring. These guys find a home and then go into a, like a hibernation that's called excavation because it's not winter. Um, and then in the late fall, they wake up and start growing. And then again, at this time of year, they start laying eggs for that spring generation. This is what they look like when they first hatch out of the egg. Very, very, very tiny. Um, and this is actually the only stage of this bug that can move and, and, and settle in a new area. So they crawl around, they find a nice place to live, they put their mouth parts into the tree and that is it for them. They cannot do that again. So if they get dislodged later, later in life, they can't reestablish, they just, they just. Um, the overwintering generation estivates over the summer, as I mentioned, the spring. And this is what they look like, these tiny black, tiny things, really hard to see about the size of a poppy seed with a little fringe of, of top wool around them. Like that, you can see how small they are and how it would be a little challenging to find those in the summer. You can find them, but it takes some training of your eye to get a good search image for it. Then they wake up in the fall, or in the case of the ones that don't, over winter, they just start growing. And then they start looking like this as they grow and they produce wool. This is much easier to see. And this is why a lot of the survey for HWA is done in the winter because there's nice fresh wool, they're easy to see. So you can go out in the woods and just find them really, really readily. Um, this wool does hang around for a while. So you can go out in like late June, July you can still find the wool, especially if it's a heavy infestation, you can find it any time. But it's easiest in the winter. Each adult, because all of our HWA are female, reproduce asexually. Each adult lays 50 to 100 eggs, uh, April to May. And that is our, those, those pieces are why we have such a problem. We have asexual reproduction, two generations a year, so two opportunities for exponential growth, and no native HWA predators because they're new to our, to our region, right? And that's why we have no HWA population control, which leads to these very heavy infestations that are incredibly damaging for our, for our eastern hemlock. Management for this, the good news is that the management for this is much more straightforward than it is for, for instance, emerald ash borer, which is expensive and has to be done, redone frequently. Um, and there's kind of a short-term solution and a long-term solution. The short-term solution is chemical control. Long-term solution is probably biological control. And I'll talk about both of those. Um, there are two chemicals that work well in a forest situation for this, for this pest. And one of them is imidacloprid. It takes a whole year after you treat it to become effective, but then it lasts for three to seven years. Um, average about five. Then there's dinotefuran, which you apply it and it works within a few weeks, but it only lasts for a year. Um, imidacloprid is pretty widely available, but is undergoing some pretty cha um, intense changes to its regulation in New York right now. So stay tuned. We'll be able to tell you within the next year what's going to happen with um, its use by the general public. Um, Dinotefuran is in New York. It can only be applied by a certified pesticide applicator. 
Um, we think that the best management practice for this is basal bark application um, because it's a very targeted application of the chemical. It goes, you apply it to the first six feet of the bark and it goes in through the bark and up into the canopy and controls the pest up there without a lot of spread into other plants. Um, this is something you have to hire somebody for. But the other nice thing about this is that if your trees are really sick or you have a really big tree, um, their circulation isn't as good as the younger trees. Um, or it's one that you just, for whatever reason, you want to get immediate protection of. You can mix the two chemicals in this method. So then you can apply them both and you get the immediate protection of the dinotephuron and then the long-term protection of the imidacloprid. Um, but you can also just do imidacloprid this way. And a lot of our partners do that because it's much less expensive than the, than the two of them together. Um, imidacloprid and dinotephuron are both neonicotinoids, which you've probably heard about because they've been in the news a lot lately because there's significant concern about neonicotinoids and our pollinators. Uh, this is the most commonly used insecticide class in the world. Um, and the reason for that is that it replaced organophosphates, which were incredibly toxic for us, as well as insects. So um, the imidacloprid is much less risk for human applicators and for other mammals than any of the other options. Um, it, this is also the chemical that's in your flea and tick collars on your dogs or in the, in the front line or the drops that you put on your dogs and cats. It's also on um, the seed coating of well over 90% of the seeds that go into the ground for our field crops. And that, that is far and away the, the most use of this chemical is those agricultural applications. This is a fairly low dose. It's a very targeted application. And the reason that we think it's good to use in this situation is that hemlocks uh, are wind pollinated. They don't produce any nectar. Their pollen is not of interest to pollinators. And so pollinators aren't visiting these trees. So if you apply it in a very um, targeted way to these trees so that other plants can't pick up the chemical, that is not a high risk application for pollinators. And you only have to use it every five years or so, which is great. And when you're considering, do I treat or do I not? Remember that the risk reward ratio is you treat and you maybe have some negative impacts from the treatment from off target um, impacts or your hemlocks die and you lose that portion of your ecosystem. There was a, um, a woman in Elizabeth Bentley in North Carolina that did some research in streams where there had been treatments done in, on stream side, the, the soil drench kind that we are not necessarily recommending here because they're not as targeted. Um, and what she found when she went back five years later was that the streams in the watersheds that had treatments done were in better shape than the controls because the hemlocks had died in the control, in the control places. And they were still there preserving the ecosystem in the places that the treatments had occurred. So treatment um, prevents this whole cascade of changes that happen when you take out, take away a foundation species from your ecosystem. And I, a foundation species is a very common species. It's so common we don't often think about it very much, but it actually creates the ecosystem that everything else uses. And that's why we call hemlocks a foundation species. So the long-term solution is probably biological control, um, which biological control is great because it is a long-term indefinite solution. Once, once you have it in place in the landscape, it just does its thing and takes care, of, takes care of the problem for you without additional cost. And it's landscape scale, which is important when you're thinking about the fourth most common tree in the state, because there's no way we could treat 
all of our hemlocks or even a reasonable minority of our hemlocks. So if we wanna keep these as a functional part of the landscape into the future, we're gonna need some kind of long-term solution. The reason it's not a short-term solution is that it's still in the research stage. So let me tell you a little bit about where we're at with, with our biological control research. Um, this is the beetle that we've been working with the longest, um, the Laracobius genus of beetles. The one that we work with, Laracobius nigrinus, is from the Pacific Northwest. And all of the Laracobius that eat HWA feed on the winter generation of HWA. They emerge in the fall as adults, nibble on HWA all winter long, and then they're young, they reproduce in the late winter, and then they're young pupate and drop in the spring. And they, they actually live in the soil over the summer while the HWA is estivating and then emerge as adults. We've been working with this, releasing, um, doing research releases since 2009 in New York, and then we now have establishment at seven sites in New York that we've determined through finding them again. And this is what they look like on, an, on a hemlock twig. You can see that they come in and um, dig around in the wool and kind of explode it a little bit while they're getting in to, to eat that HWA insect. Um, and these are the places that we've released so far in New York, um, as far west as Bath, and then all the way down to um, Mayans River Gorge down here and up in the Lake George, the new Lake George finds. Uh, our establishment has all, all been in areas that are 6A growing zone or warmer. Um, we're still hoping to find establishment in the other places, but um, so far, what we're seeing is establishment in the warmer parts of the state. The other genus that we work with is Leucotaraxis, which are silver flies. Um, these are also from the Pacific Northwest, and these feed on the spring generation of HWA. They eat the eggs of HWA. We've been releasing these since about 2017. Um, we have not established, we have not determined establishment yet. We, are, we, are, we have some hopeful signs, but um, we're not positive yet that we have establishment at any of our release sites. We're just, it's just early days for this, and these guys are really hard to find because they're flies. They fly away as soon as you shake a branch, so you can't, um, you can't survey for them the way we do for the beetles. And the, the larvae, which are actually what eat the HWA, are literally microscopic almost literally microscopic. You, they're almost impossible to even see with the naked eye. So, you know, you wind up meticulously looking at a tiny little twig trying to find them. And when you're, you're determining establishment in a forest, that's slow going. We're working on an environmental DNA process for finding these. Um, stay tuned. So that's what they look like. They are really, really small. That's the larvae <laughs> doing its job eating HWA eggs. We've released them in the mostly in the last few years um, in a lot of the same areas that that we've released Laracobius. Um, and stay tuned. We hope we'll be able to prove establishment in the next few years. Once once these uh, um, HWA predators establish, then there's a waiting period to see if they will build up enough populations that they can actually keep the HWA on the East Coast check. If you think about how many HWA were on one twig and then multiply that across all of these infested townships, towns, um, that's a lot of HWA. And so you need a lot of predators to do all that eating and it'll just take a while for the populations to build before we will know if, if it's working. So one of the most important things for good management and conservation of hemlocks is figuring out where HWA is um, and how it's doing in any given year. It moves in um, pretty random ways. It gets those little tiny crawlers can blow on wind. So that's one way we think they move through a stand. They can also, we think they're crawling onto the feet of birds and getting transported long distances that way. We think that's how the Lake George infestation happened. 
Um, so they can pop up pretty far from where you think they are. Here's the Oswego area. Um, all of these were just found in the last 18 months. Um, we actually thought that this area was totally clean until February of 2021 when somebody found, I think, this one. And then um, SLILO, who is your partnership for regional invasive species management, started working really hard on surveying areas around this. And our, one of our HWA hemlock hunter teams has been collaborating with them a lot and helping out with those surveys. And they, they've found a lot more in the area. So it's probably a good time to get out and look for HWA. Last winter and the winter before, so 1920 and 2021, were both very mild. And so we came into this winter with really intense HWA infestations that were very easy to see, which is part of why probably so many of them were found in the last 18 months. And I would really encourage you to go out and look this spring or early summer because we had high mortality, probably not that high in your area because you've got the nice uh, moderating effects of winter temperatures of the lake. But the populations won't be as high next year. They'll still be there, but they'll be harder to find. So this is a, this is a good year to look. If you're a landowner, um, figure out where your hemlock trees are. You can use like things, aerial imagery. They often, when you, when you zoom way into your property, they'll give you leaf off imagery. So winter or early spring pictures. And that makes it really easy to figure out where your conifers are if you have a big property and you don't know where your hemlocks are. And then you can narrow in on those areas and look for hemlock. Um, and then survey for HWA. And if you find it, go ahead and treat it because that is the short-term solution. That's the way to save trees that are on our landscape today. Ways to do that, um, when you survey, you wanna check for presence or absence of HWA and report what you find, ideally to IMAP invasives, um, which is the state reporting tool for invasive species. You can also put it in iNaturalist and that you can toggle that on and off in IMAP. So if you just put it in iNaturalist, then you can see it in, in IMAP as well. The best time to survey is November through mid-April or early May. Um, figure out, think about your tree health because that will help you decide when you need to treat. Look for branches that are on the ground, especially in the winter. Um, branches get knocked down by storms, but they also get nibbled off by porcupine and drop down. <laughs> so there's often twigs on the ground that will give you a, a snapshot into what's happening in the canopy. It's often you can't reach branches on your hemlock tree, especially if it's in a, in a grove of hemlocks. Um, with, when you can reach branches, grab them, flip them over, and look at the underside. It can help to have like a black glove or something that you hold behind the branch. Uh, it just makes the contrast with those white, those little white fluffy balls, it makes them a little easier to see. And if you can reach, check multiple sides of the tree because again, this is, they're so small <laughs> that, you know, an infestation can grow for a while on one side of the tree before they make it over to the other side. Um, and look at overall tree health. What you see as trees start to go down is this sort of ghostly grayish look. Um, we call these ghost trees. We have them all over on Taganic Lake. Sorry, Cayuga Lake, our lake here. And um, the other thing you might see is what we call lollipop trees. Um, do you see how these, these hemlocks have a lot of um, branches where you can still see the twigs are still hanging on, but they're dead and they're dead way high up and just until just that little tuft at the top is left. That's pretty classic um, sign of an HWA infestation that's getting pretty severe. But often because the, the progression is kind of slow, sometimes people just think this is what hemlocks look like. So particularly if all of your foliage is way up high and you see some of that 
those branches that still have the little twigs on them, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a red flag. And it's, that's a good place to focus your search. If you don't have property of your own, um, either get a team or go out by yourself and look at some hemlock trees out there in the world. Um, look for HWA and report what you find. Um, you can do something as easy as just um, downloading the IMAP app. And it's super easy. You just take a picture, tell them what you found, and upload it. It takes about 90 seconds. It's very easy. Um, if you want to get into something more complicated, reach out to us at the Hemlock Initiative. We have a, we have a volunteer program for you where you can um, assess the this, tell us more about the stand and what the health is and how much HWA is there. That'll help the land managers of that property and the properties around you um, make better decisions about hemlock conservation. So um, this is a pretty serious pest with a very high mortality rate for hemlock trees. Um, and it's arrived in your area. Now is a great time to go out and survey your trees and um, start thinking about what you're going to do as this pest moves through, moves through your region. In the near term, saving your trees means treating them. And um, it's not that expensive. It's about a dollar per diameter inch. Um, to treat these trees with the single chemical. It's more like $3 per diameter inch if you do both chemicals together. But it's, it's not a huge expense. And you only have to do it every five years. And in the long term, we're going to try to get the biocontrols up and running so that um, they're available so that we can keep these trees as a, part, a functional part of our forest into the future. And that is my talk, I think. Yes. So thank you for spending part of your lunch hour with me. Um, Please visit us online where we have a plethora of information for you on all things HWA. We also have Facebook and Instagram website um, channels where, where you can follow us. And if you email this address, it'll come to me and it'll also come to my boss and or our field director. So one of us should have a good answer for your question. Are there any questions? Yeah, thank you so much, Caroline. Um, and we'll just say, as Robert said, if you want to put your questions in the chat, that's fine. If you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, that's fine too. Hi, hi. <clears throat> excuse me. Hi, this is Laura. I had a question. Um, do you, is it better to start treating trees before there are any hemlock woolly adelgids or would you want to, can you wait until you see some? That is a great question. And I think the answer has changed a little bit in the last few years. Um, we used to say that it was never a good idea to treat before you saw it. And we're now saying if you're in a situation like you're in the Owasco Lake watershed where they found it in every drainage that has hemlock now, except for two. Um, if you can't, even if you can't see it, it's probably there. Go ahead and treat. You guys aren't quite in that, I don't think you're in quite that situation yet because it just arrived. And so in this case, I would say, as long as you're out there looking every, every winter, it would be fine to wait until you start to, to, to see the pest. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, George asked if the beetles, the chemical affects the beetles. So it's a great question. Um, the beetles only eat living HWA. So generally the answer is no, but we do, and, and it's standard practice across the East Coast to do a mixture of chemical and biological efforts. Um, when, when we can, there's a schedule for that. So if you're using, the, 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 the sticking point is if you're using just imidacloprid, the one that takes a year to become effective, there is a window where there's, the chemical has arrived in the, in the branches and it's getting picked up, but it's not a high enough 
dose to kill the HWA yet. And that's when you don't want to be releasing a new population of predators into, into your landscape. So we just time our releases with, with chemical management on the property to make sure that we don't do that. Um, Kathy asked if state parks like Battle Island are involved in the search and treatment process. Well, um, New York State Parks has been an early adopter of HWA management so far. Um, they've been very aggressive. They did one of the earliest sort of prioritization triage processes in New York. And they've been very aggressive at treating HWA in the high, the ones that came out high in, in the prioritization, which are Deganic State Park, Watkins Glen, um, some of those places that have a whole bunch of hemlocks right there in the gorges. Um, I don't know about Battle Island, whether the, the staff, how much hemlock is there, whether they're actively surveying or not, et cetera. So I would reach out to that park specifically, but generally parks has been um, very involved with, with survey and management across the state. Do these insects, Robert asks, only attack hemlock species? They, um, when you say these insects, I'm gonna guess you're saying HWA. Um, HWA only attacks hemlocks in this area. Um, in Asia, there's a secondary host that is an Asian spruce, which is where they do sexual reproduction with other generations that we don't have here. Um, but here in the, U in the US, they're only attacking our hemlocks. Um, there are other adelgids. Adelgids are kind of related, to, they're in the same general family as aphids. Um, there are other adelgids that attack other species. There's a large adelgid, there's, um, there's a really nasty um, balsam woolly adelgid that's been a real problem out west and is now becoming a significant issue um, here as well. Um, there's a pine bark adelgid, which, which is native here and totally not a problem. It's just one of, one of the many sort of small, small pests on trees that don't cause a significant impact. But our, the HWA happens to be a really big deal. So no, other trees and plants are not at risk from these adelgids. Are there any other questions? I have a question, Caroline. Um, well, I guess, well, I have two, but the first one is, um, I'm wondering if there's any problem of hemlock recruiting. You said it was like a, a food tree for maybe species like deer. And I'm wondering if like deer browsing in the understory is preventing recruitment of new hemlock trees. Cause I could see that as also maybe being part of the problem if true. Um, that the trees are dying, but they're not being replaced? That's an interesting question. Um, we have some areas where we see really strong regeneration and others where we don't. Um, the, the problem with relying on regeneration of the hemlock is that unlike like emerald ash borer, that doesn't attract trees until they're a certain size, right? Because it's a boring, a boring insect and it wants a big enough trunk. This one doesn't care how big the hemlock are. And so they'll take out everything in the stand, including the regeneration. Um, and because they're this asexually reproducing insect, I'm not sure that we're gonna see like a wave go through and then everything's fine. I think they're gonna be around for a while. Mm -hmm. Why we're so focused on a, on a biological control solution. What's your other question? Um, so my, my other question is, you know, do you see it as a possibility that we might ever have that other generation introduced and then like oh. sexual reproduction? Um, I don't know. So Nobody has ever documented sexual reproduction anywhere in the United States, even in places like botanic gardens that would have that other tree probably. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if the, there just aren't enough of them in the landscape if it, or if it's a tree that doesn't, you know, doesn't thrive over here. 
I don't, I don't have a good answer for that. Yeah. I do know that, that um, I think it's the spring generation, the viridians, the, the ones that don't, don't hibernate, they're the ones that do, even here, they do produce winged offspring that fly off to find that other tree, but they never find it. <laughs> so, so far it hasn't been a problem. I think it would be a significant change in landscape practices to have suddenly a bunch of that other species brought in. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Interesting. Do you want to ask about um, hemlock resistance? Sure. Whether or not there's any hemlock resistance. That's the other potential long-term solution um, would be fine. Like, like what, um, what, what people have been doing with chestnut, right? Go and find a bunch of trees that survived the blight and then see if they, if you can produce some kind of uh, resistant tree. Um, there are, there is a lab that's working on that. They think they found one bulletproof stand that, that doesn't seem to be going down to HWA in the Delaware water gap. And they've taken cuttings and produced, I think they're called scions. You know, they're, they're genetically identical offspring from the cuttings and then sent them around to a bunch of different places to see how they do. We'll see how they do. We have some of them here at Cornell. Um, we're a little worried that this, um, this doesn't seem like it's a completely resistance driven system though. It seems based on what we're seeing out West, um, we think it might be more of a predator driven system because out West what happens is you get an HWA population on a few trees, it blows up and becomes really heavy. And then the predators move in from around the landscape and start feeding on it and then the population collapses. So there could be some, a little bit of both happening, but um, we're hoping that the predators are gonna be the quicker solution. Cause that, you know, if we could figure that out we might actually be able to keep the current trees in the landscape versus losing the species from the landscape and then replanting one tree at a time. But if they both work, that would be even better. Yeah. Okay, um, we, we have time. If, if anyone else has, you know, a last question, um, we, we have time for that or, or not. You can just have 10 more minutes to do whatever you need to do during your lunch break. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Caroline, can you tell us for our area, are there any plans now to introduce like a beetle um, or the fly since? Yes, I yes. Okay. So, um, so your prism has been working really hard on figuring out where HWA is. And they're also looking for, um, places that would be good biological control research areas. Mm -hmm. we, need, we need a public, a public um, officially preserved forest with HWA, where there's lots of HWA, but the trees are still healthy and there are low hanging branches so we can find, you know, do, do our thing, survey, do all the things we need to do for research without mm -hmm. tree climbing. Um, and um, we're hoping that that one of those will work out for this, either this spring or next spring. Um, we're focusing our releases this year in the in the warmer growing zone, so it just depends on what mortality was like at the sites that they found and how many how many bugs we get. Interestingly, the West Coast biocontrol populations, which we go out west, we clip foliage and ship it back, and then we rear it in a quarantine facility to keep from releasing the west coast version of HWA. And then we harvest the biocontrols as they, as they emerge from that foliage and release them. Um, out west, do you remember those really, really crazy high temperatures? They had like 115 degrees in Portland last summer. We're not seeing, we're not sure about this, but it seems like there aren't quite as many flies this year in our foliage. And so there's some chance that they, they were hit by some of that crazy climate vari variation that they saw up there. The beetles seem to be emerging really well. They're underground in the summer, so they don't care if it becomes 115 degrees. <laughs> but the flies are out in the world experiencing all of those temperatures. So 
it just depends on how many we have and how much HWA there is at those sites and you know when when we can get up the stars to align to do some releases but we hope to do some releases in your area so. great thank you George said hemlock poison and I want to answer that question but I don't know what he was asking I, I wonder if the question was about does eastern hemlock produce the poison? Like, is that the hemlock that that produced the famous poisons for? Oh, that's a great question. Um, ironically, that that one is actually another one that's in our area, which is called poison hemlock, which is a form. It's a it's a, a short-lived perennial herb. That, that grows streamside and which to go to our other website that um, identifying weeds, a New York weed identification, you can Google it and find it. And we've got a, a page on that and some of the other poisonous plants in the area. Um, don't eat it. <laughs> Great. Any part of it, any time of year. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, um, we want to thank Caroline Marshner so very much for this awesome presentation. Um, we will be posting it to our YouTube and our website. Um, so if you know people who might have been interested in this but couldn't make this time work, um, it will be available sometime next week. Um, and I do wanna give a shout out that um, next week, next Friday, we're gonna have Dr. Greg McGee from SUNY ESF talking about um, the wildflower restoration project they're doing, trying to restore wildflowers and forest understories of upstate New York. Um, so please tune back in. It's going to be the same Zoom link next week if you'd like to join us. Um, and virtually or in person, like, thank you, Caroline. This was great. Thank you.